This conference will now be recorded. We can do it, um, uh, but we'll hear from you again tonight on questions and so comments and so forth that you have. So, um, with that <clears throat> introduction, then I'm going to go ahead and hand. Yeah. Could you turn the mic? Could you list the call? Dennis, can you pull your mic over? Do we have a list of all the coachings we're going to make? I forget if we had that. Yeah, I believe it's both in the work plan and it's in the 
schedule okay. itself. So we should probably like say next month, do another check in with you on the schedule and bring it up on the screen just so you can see it really quickly. And is that but, work plan somewhere on the city website? I don't believe it is yet. We're maybe working, maybe working toward <laughs> getting a comprehensive plan update web page going at some point. Um, but yeah, and so if that happens, then we'll definitely post that stuff okay. there. <clears throat> Thank you. That's it for me for the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. Um, so like Ethan um, mentioned, um, I'll be tackling the family daycare uh, code update. Um, the first part of it, I'll um, tackle the questions and comments the commission had last week or a few weeks ago, last month's planning commission meeting about the topic. Um, and then I'll follow up with the proposed amendments to um, the family daycare code in the listener municipal code. Um, so to bring the city code compliant to the state. Um, so the commission requested more detail on state licensing requirements, um, how other jurisdictions are updating their regulations and whether family daycares must be allowed in apartments and uh, parking requirements. So I'll hit one of those in order. Um, first is the state licensing requirements. Um, the Washington State Department of Children, Youth and Families or DCYF um, regulates family daycares and provides licensing. Um, these licensing requirements are listed in WAC 110-300, um, and there's several of these requirements uh, for licensing in the WACs. Um, it's pretty pretty broad range and it's pretty, pretty big. Um, and these cover topics such as professional development and training requirements, daycare environment, interactions and curriculum and program administration and oversight. Um, the commission noted uh, some concerns about open space and indoor capacity requirements. Um, and WAC 110-300-0145, which is attachment A in the memo, um, it lists outdoor learning space requirements, which requires the play space to be a minimum 75 square feet of usable space per child. Um, and within those requirements for the, the outdoor play, play space, um, they list other items like fencing, exits, um, what kind of stuff they need to interact with, um, so on and so forth. If it's off-site, um, a safe route to get there, how they're going to get the uh, children there. Um, so there are licensing requirements that um, cover those provisions. And then additionally with capacity, this is located in WAC 110-300-0354, which is attachment B in the memo. Um, it requires that a licensed indoor early learning program space have a minimum 35 square feet per child in attendance. Um, and then that 35 square feet deduct can't count things like um, areas under desks or if you have play equipment or furniture in the way, um, like the kitchen. There's a lot of things you can't count towards that. Um, and capacity also takes into account age of the children, um, amount of experience and training of the provider, uh, number of staff and other factors. So you could say, kind of for an example, and this is not per verbatim, but if a family child care home provider um, has about one year experience and only so much training um, in, that, in those WACs, in the licensing, um, it might say they can only have oversight of six children and two of them can be under the age of four. Doesn't say that per, per verbatim, but um, that's kind of how the capacity stuff works. Um, so um, it's it's not linear, um, but the seat licensing requirements does handle the capacity issue um, prior before the approach to the city. So the city uh, does have the option of providing a copy of those seat licensing requirements if someone would like to have a family daycare home in the city or direct them to the TCYF website where it has licensing requirements and directs you to those WACs. Um, next is our, uh, the regulations in other jurisdictions. Um, we looked around, again, the Puget Sound area since they are further ahead in the comprehensive plan update process than we are um, since their update is due in 2024. Um, so uh, we found a couple, um, Burien and Bellevue specifically, and the way they are updating the family daycare uh, regulations is very similar to how we are doing um, or proposing. Um, and then we are going to plan on analyzing a few more jurisdictions um, just 
just to complete our analysis to confirm um, kind of what we're doing seems to be the right direction. Um, we're not seeing anything that's um, indicating any pushback or um, anything different than what we're doing at this time. Is there, is there any value in continuing that analysis? So <clears throat> I think there's kind of two things that we need to talk about. One is um, even for the Puget Sound jurisdictions that are required to adopt next year, it may be still too early for them to have adopted their codes, mm -hmm. except for some of the ones that Alec found out about. But there's many others out there that are probably still in progress. Um, and we don't know how they're handling it. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that probably what the city attorney will say is that we're obligated to comply with these requirements. Um, and so there might be limited utility in continuing that analysis. We're certainly willing to try and look a little bit more. Um, um, you know, but if, you know, for instance, if there is a jurisdiction out there that has adopted some way, new nuance or something, a way of pushing back on the um, on the state, there might be some kind of a legal question, you know, not, I'm not an attorney, but there might, could be some kind of a legal question about whether they're then subject to, um, you know, being sued or something like that because they're not meeting state, state requirements. And so, um, uh, that's not to say that there can be zero variety in these things. It has to meet the state law, but there might be some other, um, uh, th there might be some other variations of way ways that we can write the code that could tailor it further to the center, but we still have to meet those core, those core state requirements. <clears throat> Yeah, and um, the family daycare stuff, Alec, you might have to help me, but I think that that's a little bit newer, but the manufactured home code stuff that we're going to be talking about later um, goes back quite a ways um, in, in the essence of that. And so we can ask him that that question and just at, at least see if see what he would say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just, what's that? I just have a question, if if possible. It's kind of a little bit following up, I think, what you're referring to. But if these are state mandates, do we have any option of, I mean, what if we have to comply with the state mandates, what are the options? I mean, it seems like we just have to make sure our code is paralleling what they're mandating. But I guess my other question is, so it, it sounds like it's the DC, DCYF that formulated all these, and so so there. It just seems strange that this, I'm assuming, appointed board is making the laws that we then must follow. No, think, Do you know what I'm following? No, no, I think DCYF is implementing what the legislature has put in law. In, in law, okay. So they're doing that. So legislature has, I mean, all, all those specifications of 35 feet or 75 feet per child or whatever, all those things are just. That's in the law. Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> so the recourse would be like a regular citizen approaching your two representatives in a single senator yeah. to vote on those state legislature issues. issues. OK. But these are already passed laws that have been issued and so mandated. The, these things are in state law, and and that's correct. Um, and so, right, there's limited amount that we can probably do to push back on that. I'm just kind of putting on my Bronson hat, and I'm not saying that we, right. again, can't tweak some of this a little bit, but we'll still have to comply with those core requirements about not prohibiting family daycares and residential uses, and right. then those other things that Alex is going to talk to you about, signage, parking, um, some some of those other things, um, and and 
Yes. So the the way that I'm the way that I understand that state laws get written is sometimes there's experts from these agencies like DCYF that are sort of come up with drafts of these of these rules and then that gets worked through various committees and so forth in the in this legislature until it's until it's adopted. But um, yeah. <laughs> the way the way I'm the way I'm looking at it is that <clears throat> is the fact that I'm kind of going along with what I already said here is that we're gonna we need to comply with the state legislature's guidelines and state guidelines. The thing I'm looking for, we'll look for from, from from YouTube will be at some point you'll point out to us in our code after you have inserted the requirements. Identify to us, here's some areas, here's two or three areas or whatever, that if you want to embellish or modify or expand or whatever, here's some areas that you can as it relates to the city of the center. And so we're not going to deal with what the state says, do this. We're going to say, yes, sir, we'll do that. But then as you go through, you'll say to us, okay, here's, here's a half a dozen things that Planning Commission can wrestle with, give us some <clears> guidance <throat> on. Do we want to go to the public? Do we want to do we want to do something different than what we have already in the code? Make it either more stringent or less stringent. Or is that correct? Is that what I should expect to have happen? Um, I mean, I think it's partly correct. And so, one of those areas Alec is going to talk to you about tonight. And so, the city already has a. Uh, some code provisions that regulates um, that regulate um, daycares, and so one of the things he's going to talk to you about tonight is separating out some of those provisions that are specifically going to pertain to family daycares and bringing those into compliance with the state law versus talking about what we can do with um, daycares or, or what we're proposing that you do um, uh, with daycares more generally, and so. If the Planning Commission wanted to go further or tweak the existing regulations for daycare centers, sorry, I should have I should have called them centers for daycare centers, then it can do that. But for family daycares, that's where it's a little bit more locked down. And so we can't. You could be less um, restrictive than the state laws require. Um, but you can't be more restrictive than the state laws require. And so, um, for instance, the, the state laws require that you have a, um, an area uh, where, where people can drop off their kids. You couldn't say, well, but we think there should be five parking spaces here uh, because that would be more restrictive than what the state is requiring um, as an example. Um, so does it, does that make sense? We'll, we'll make this a little bit more real for you when Alec talks through that portion of the of the code, but um, that's generally kind of where it's at. <clears throat> oh, before Alex tries to get back on track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you going to say anything further on apartments? That was my next. Yeah. Okay. That's my next point. I, I really want to see. I really want. Yeah. Okay. So because that's got me really stumped. I want to see what. How that looks because I have a hard time envisioning the third floor daycare center. I just do I whatever. Anyhow, thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Hill. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the segue uh, into this topic. Uh, that's okay. I think that was an important discussion to have. Um, so, um, in RCW 3670A 450 subsection 1, um, it states that cities cannot prohibit family daycare homes and residential dwellings located in all areas zoned for residential or commercial uses. Um, however, those RCWs don't provide a definition for residential dwellings with regard to family daycares. So we did discuss with the city attorney Bronson um, on um, his interpretation of that, and he did conclude with us that uh, it would include apartments, um, the residential dwellings. Um, in that RCW. So yes, uh, apartments can have family daycare homes, but once you go back to those licensing requirements for outdoor play space or indoor capacity, um, the state will, with the DCYF, will regulate um, 
how many children can be in that home. It's probably likely not going to be 12, um, maybe six or four, and maybe certain age ranges as well that they'll limit um, the children be in that family daycare home provider. Um, but yes, apartments are subject to being um, okay. having to allow family daycare. So homes. if you got a third third a third floor uh, apartment that's uh, 1,200 square foot. That that would apply. You could you could have up with six children in there, and there's going to be enough square footage for those children and and, and play area. That's a How that's a good that question. Um, I don't know for a fact that six children could be in 1,200 square feet, but um, just the way the WACs are written, the state laws, they do have to allow a family daycare home, and it may be two children at most okay. in that living so, facility. So, so, so it's really square feet per child. Or yeah, seventy five. You subtract out the furniture and desk area. Yeah, and like so, um, so personal living know. quarters and stuff like that. It's like the main, main non like bedrooms of the home. Um, so it's like living areas, bonus room or kitchen, etc. Um, I'm just looking at this at some point. Some some someone in our city who lives in their new apartments in Riverside there decides that they want to have a child care center in, in their home in their apartment. Are we going to have language in our code that's going to say, yep, you can sure do that? We won't have language in our code that says you can do that specifically, but we can't prohibit it. But, but what but, would prohibit it would be the other regulations of, of what would have to be provided or want to be held in that space. Correct? They would have to meet all the, yeah, the requirements. city's yes. regulations and all the state regulations as well. And so that's basically what we're saying. That's what Alec is saying. They could do it, but they'd have to meet all those regulations, which might mean that they have a very small area, say in their family room or something like that, that's, that ends up only accommodating a couple of kids. I think he just said six, just kind of throwing out an example. An example number um, <clears throat> but the other important point here that um, I want to drive home and sorry I'm just it's okay. jumping in again here <laughs> is that these are family daycares these are not daycare centers right so I think that at least in the state's eyes these are not any different than than um, a family caring for its own children or and then you know perhaps it invites the cousins over or something like that so we're not talking about commercial daycare centers <laughs> we're talking about somebody that's caring for a couple of, of kids in their in their home up to 12 kids if they meet all of the state requirements right so um, you know, not the least of which is the 35 square feet of indoor play space and the, the um, outdoor play space requirement. So even an apartment would have to have access to outdoor play space. That's a lot so. of space. Okay. Well, I think, I, I think uh, for me, I think we beat this to death, but <laughs> because I think, unfortunately, uh, the likelihood of that happening is somewhere pretty slim and none. I, I, I will say, uh, uh, we should let Alex roll, but I, I would say that uh, <laughs> at my place, um, it's uh, like a daycare facility, but the kids never go away. They're, they're <laughs> horrible. And that, my neighbors aren't ready to run me out of town just yet. Uh, of course, they're like 17 years in place. Thank you. Try again, Alex. That's no problem. Um, so um, moving on from that discussion, um, the next was the parking. Um, and Ethan's already kind of um, tapped into this a little bit. So where um, are we at now? So should be, what page are we on? It's like, it's linked together with apartments in the memo. So it should be in that section, apartments and parking. So it's that last paragraph. Um, anyhow, uh, family daycares cannot be prohibited in residential dwellings, and only specific regulations can be applied to these. Um, parking is not one of those specific regulations that are outlined in RCWs pertaining to family daycare homes. And the city 
city doesn't have the authority to regulate the parking because of those state requirements. Um, and placing those additional parking requirements on family daycares would not meet those state requirements. So um, as we go through our proposed revisions, you'll see um, specifically in 18270 um, for family daycares, but not other daycares as we define them, um, which I'll go more detail as well. For family daycare homes, they'll just have to meet basically what is already there for those existing residential dwellings and meet the um, parking provisions for that residential dwelling in whatever zone it is in. Yes. We have 12 kids. You can have up to 12 kids. You're going to have parking for two cars. Um, plus, there's an additional requirement that you have to demonstrate that you have safe fun mobile work. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I know there's nothing we can do about it. We, we could change our LDR code or NDR code to say freeze parking spaces. <laughs> 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 anyway, I think that's a real problem. <clears throat> but it's not ours to solve. Yeah, the, I guess this might be a good spot. The other the one provision that uh, 3670 450 provides that we can regulate is. Um, Limitation on hours of operation. I know that you didn't include that. Uh, thoughts on that? I'll go ahead, Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think that you could choose to regulate it. I think if you did that, you would want to provide some kind of reasonable, bu reasonable buffer for people to come home from work to pick up their kids and that sort of thing. So you wouldn't say, hey, they've got to close by 4.30 p.m. or 5 p.m. because that would make it very difficult <clears throat> um, to, to do this. Um, you know, by the same token, you probably don't necessarily want to allow them to be open until midnight or something. Well, that's like the point. It talks about being compatible with whatever zone in your neighborhood you're in. If, if, if I'm living next to a daycare center. I don't want cars coming and going at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. That would be a reasonable expectation that those residents would have. Yeah, so I guess I would suggest, you know, maybe something like 6 or 6.30 a.m. to maybe 7 to 7 or 8 at night, something like that. I, I think we ought to consider some provision. Yeah, and I can read verbally what it says from the RCW. It says you can limit hours of operations to facilitate neighborhood compatibility, while also providing appropriate opportunity for persons who use family daycare and who work a non-standard work shift. So um, as like Ethan suggested, maybe having earlier and later hours, but not 11 p.m. necessarily, but kind of accommodates people that might work a little later past five. Um, so it gives some latitude, but not too much. Um, so that is some that is some flexibility that the um, planning commission could have, um, and some policy decisions that kind of go a little outside the scale of the, the state mandates. So that is something we can think through. Does anybody know? Do we have many or any family daycare centers in the center? We definitely do. Are you talking about registered. daycare centers or just family? family care. By our definition, the family, the family daycare, daycare is small in the house kind of daycare. Mm -hmm. It's like three houses down from the. And I don't know. This that's kind of a difficult question to answer because they don't always come to us. <laughs> right, I was going to say, are they registered? <laughs> yeah, and and so before Sorry. the current code update that we're talking about right now. The other thing to think about is that the code only had many daycare centers and date and then daycare centers and many daycare centers were um, up to 12. It's like six to 12. Oh, six to 12. Yeah. And then daycare centers were above that. Mm -hmm. And so we don't always know if for instance, somebody has just a couple of kids or something like that. That that would now, if it, you know, if if we adopt new code, if that would now qualify as a family daycare, I'm 
highly skeptical that they would come to the city. They probably go get their state licensing and all of that stuff, but they probably a lot of the times don't contact the city. Even in the new code, there's no requirement. The city doesn't provide a license or permitting or anything like that. So well, if they're running a business, they would have to get a oh. business license. Mm -hmm. um, in the couple of years that I've been approving business license, I haven't seen one, but that they could have been approved previously. And then if it already is in existence, it just auto approves unless they have changes. So, um, okay. and I can change that if that's a concern, of course. So it doesn't auto approve things. And we can check into their state licensing. Um, so yeah, your neighbor probably is licensed. I just it didn't come across my desk. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they are. Thank you. I think we have. Um, I think uh, you have quite a few revisions because we've got different parts of the. Uh, like the different zoning yes. that you got to plow through. Yes. So I was going to see if we could let Alec kind of run <laughs> yes. through that. And no, that was a good stopping point as well because I was done with the first yeah. third and the second third. But, but I definitely thirds. don't want to kill the discussion, but maybe yes. if, we, if you jot down your, your thought and then maybe we'll just go back and hit those points. I, I just looking at the like the amount of revisions we need and it's yep. quite a few. I appreciate that. Um, so. The first of the proposed revisions are um, in the definitions, and Ethan's already touched into this. Um, we actually had three different types of daycare uses that we defined, which were family daycare homes, mini daycare centers, and daycare centers. Um, family daycare home was for six or fewer children, mini daycare centers was six to 12 children, and then daycare center was tw uh, 13 or more in a more of a commercial use. Um, our proposed revision, um, we've updated the family daycare home to match the definition as provided by the RCW. Um, and then the two other uses, mini daycare center and daycare center, are now combined into one use, just a daycare center. And this definition has been updated to include daycares that care for 13 more children or do not meet the state's definition and requirements of family daycare home. Um, so that's our proposed um, changes to the definitions in 1840. Um, next is 18130 or the LDR zoning. Um, currently family daycare homes and mini daycare centers are limited use and subject to type two site plan review. Um, having family daycare homes subject to site plan review may violate state law since it would oppose a condition more restrictive than on other residential dwellings in the same zone since they wouldn't be subject to site plan review. So a proposed revision is to um, outright permit family daycare homes. And then we have a footnote directing, directing them to LCMC 18270, which are those uh, listed regulations for family daycare homes. Um, and I'll get to that at the end. That's our last section to discuss. And then many daycare centers have been revised to daycare centers to match the update in the definitions. Um, and then moving on to chapter 18140, the MDR zoning code. Um, family daycares are not a listed use within the city's code currently. Um, so the proposed revision is to um, outright permit family daycare homes and be consistent with the requirements of, again, 18270, um, those family daycare regulations. Um, and then the permitted conditional use language has been revised to eliminate any kind of confusion or discrepancies of the permitted conditional uses in the MDR zone. So it's clear that the relationship of the MDR conditional uses are those that are conditional uses in the LDR zone. So that, <clears throat> that might be a little bit confusing and we had to read over this provision several different times to <laughs> understand it. Um, it might actually be helpful, Alec, on that one too for us to pull up the memo and the, or, or sorry, the attachments, um, so they can see what we mean. That would be attachment. Um, so what I was trying to figure out is the reference in 18140 to table 18130, is that only for conditional uses or is it for all uses in the 18130 table? Well, those are some of the things we were trying to figure out. I mean, I think the intent is that the conditional uses in the MDR zone are the same as the conditional uses in the LDR zone? So I think that word is the big group. Okay. Because it talks about conditional uses. Right. In the table. So we propose some language for that, and so I don't know if you mean it can be improved on what we did, Probably. which is fine, or or just over-existing, but 
um, should be at the bottom of the page. Yeah, right there. Is this attachment C? No. And C3. See, that's page. That's, page. That's just referencing conditional uses as opposed to all uses. Right, because the permitted uses are above that. Is that what you mean? No, but you were saying one of the goal was to have the uses to be identical in each use zone. So that's why we're referencing the 18130 table. So this reference here and the permitted uses above are all inclusive of what's in 18130? The permitted uses in um, the MDR zone aren't inclusive of 18130, oh. but the conditional okay. uses in the MDR zone. Maybe I yeah, that's so we're trying to. How it reads currently, it's really, it says conditional uses allowed are those that are um, permitted conditional or prohibited uses as referenced in that code. So we're just saying conditional uses are those conditional uses listed, just saying conditional and conditional to line it up. Well, yeah, so um, I mean, basically what this says, or what this says right now, before we revised it, it says that the conditional uses include all of the permitted conditional and prohibited uses in the LDR zone, which I don't think is what they meant when they wrote this. Because, for instance, industrial uses are permitted in the LDR zone, but through a conditional use permit in the MDR zone, if you read this the way it's written, you could have some industrial use in that zone. That's what we were trying to trying to clear up, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> at least that's the way that we understood one of the pitfalls of this. <laughs> so we we basically just very simply stated that the conditional uses in the MDR district are those listed as conditional uses in the the LDR district, which I think is maybe what they were trying to get at i guess the one question i have right now and rereading this again is it references the permitted uses in the single family district and so maybe they meant those to also be conditional uses in the um so we'll, we'll take a second look at that and make sure that we're not excluding anything in mdr that should be in mdr by conditional use um um, but as an, uh, you know, another example, for instance, there's a, a fairly extensive list of permitted uses in the LDR district that include, um, you know, things like, like sheds and uh, detached garages and um, those types of things. Um, and so, again, what this basically said, this language basically says right now is you have to go get a conditional use permit to place a shed in the MDR district, which is, again, not what I think that they were intending to do, but... <clears throat> you know how we can solve this? Yeah. Um, single use table. What's that? A single use table for all our... Yes. For all our zone, but a single use table. That'd be, that'd be one way to solve it. I think in the interim, though, we'll take yeah. one more look at that LDR table and bring in anything that should be a permitted use from LDR into MDR above this conditional use section and make sure that we're not conditionally approving anything in MDR that shouldn't be a conditional use. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I have the same sentiment, sentiment about um, having just the one table because just going through this, it's you can interpret like four, 400 different ways it feels like. And, and so where do you find that table? It, it, yeah. Is it on the sheet or is it just in the other? It's in the statement? it's in the other code okay. section that we didn't include. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Just <clears throat> and this discussion is kind of the same with the next zoning district, the RP um, residential professional and um, LCMC eighteen one forty five. Um, it doesn't outright allow family daycares because it says allowed permitted uses are those permitted uses in the LDR, MDR, and C one zones so currently um family daycares 
um, bridges are prohibited in the C1 zone, and then they're either a limited use in the LDR zone and not mention the MDR zone, but we're making those updates for consistency. Um, so if you read it right now, it's just really unclear in the RP zone how they are permitted or not. Um, so our proposed revision is, again, LDR and MDR, family daycare homes are gonna be a permitted use. And then um, the next chapter is C1 and C3 zoning. We're gonna be updating the C1 zoning code to allow um, family daycare homes. Um, so therefore it's consistent LDR, MDR, and C1 as referenced in the RP zone that family daycare homes are permitted in all three of those zones and it alleviates any discrepancies there. So will RP, will we allow um, daycare, daycare centers in the C1 zone? In the C1 zone? Um, currently, um, in a, that's the next uh, chapter. I'm going to go over the daycare centers. Oh, um, I'm sorry. oh, you're good. And I can dive right into that. Um, we are proposing to um, currently, it says daycare facilities, um, and they are conditional use in the C1 zone and not allowed in the C3 zone. We're just revising that to say daycare centers, but keeping the conditional or yeah, conditional use in the C1 zone and prohibited in the C3 zone, but for family daycare homes in the C1, C3 zones, um, we are making those a permitted use since per the RCWs, um, they have to be permitted when um, located in an existing residence. Um, why, why would you allow family care homes in the C3 zone? Residential? Residential dwellings aren't allowed to see. So there could be existing, existing homes there. So our thought at least is that Yeah, that was one of my questions when Alec was talking about that. Um, so now that we know that there's not. <laughs> I, would, I would encourage someone to go look at that to make sure. But I was just looking at the maps on, on the website. I mean, it's basically the, the casinos, right? So, um, so, hope, so, so there are no existing homes. Homes aren't required. So therefore, family home centers aren't allowed. I think you could either prohibit them or allow them, and it would basically have no effect, right? Because there's if you allow them, there's no home. So it's if you prohibit them, it really doesn't affect anybody either. So but three years from now, someone will say, why are those idiots? C3. <laughs> um, it's just an inconsistency that I don't like. Yeah. So I, I think we'd be fine prohibiting that, and we'll double check that with Bronson that there's for some reason not, not an issue there. And Ethan, it's a pretty small zone, so it probably wouldn't take that long to analyze, correct? So yeah. we could take a look. Um, moving on to the JP zone, uh, Chapter 18, 158. Um, the acre facilities currently are permitted in the town center, and town general plan districts, not allowed in the town employment plan district, and a conditional use in the town residential mixed use plan district. Um, however, family daycare homes, again, per the RCW, is required to be allowed in use in all residential and commercial zones. Um, so our proposed revision is to add family daycare homes as a use to that permit matrix in the junction plan zoning and they will be permitted in all four plan districts and we'll add a footnote requiring compliance with 18270. Um, I'm getting closer to addressing soon. Um, and then the former daycare facilities consistent with WAC Title 388 was a listed use in the junction plan zone. We have revised this with daycare centers consistent with state licensing requirements and this will be um, just like it is currently uh, permitted in the town center and town general plan districts, prohibited in the town employment plan district, and a conditional use in the town residential mixed use plan district. And then so, next. So I would is, encourage you to use that same word, daycare facility consistent with WAC, wherever we have daycare centers listed as a allowed use. You say uh, keep it consistent with the daycare as it is right now with so WAC. What you're proposing. 
Oh, no, he replaced yeah, it with. Oh, yeah, we're replacing it with the daycare centers terminology. Yes, yeah, so we're trying to keep it consistent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, next is uh, the mixed use zoning district, uh, Chapter 18165. Um, currently, family daycare homes are permitted use in this zone as long as they conform to the city's business license program. Um, we are revi revising this scene. Family daycare homes, as listed, has been revised um, incorrectly because it references the wrong RCW. And um, as that business licensing requirement, we are keeping that business licensing requirement, but moving it to 18270, um, just again for consistency for how we're permitting these throughout each zone. Um, and then again, we have that footnote added to the permitted use for family daycare homes. For, um, guiding the reviewer to look at 18270. And then next is the Urban Holding District. Um, this we didn't discuss previously at the last Planning Commission meeting um, because we just didn't catch it. And then we did a keyword search just to make sure we caught family daycare homes or daycare related uses throughout the zoning um, code and other areas of the municipal code. Um, we did find that um, single family dwellings are permitted use in this zone, whereas family daycare centers and many daycare centers are conditional uses in the urban holding district. So our proposed revisions, since sing single family dwellings are permitted use, um, we have to permit per the RCWs um, family daycare homes. So now this is listed as a permitted use and then um, we've revised many daycare centers to daycare centers as we updated and for consistency again, and um, those remain a conditional use in the urban holding district. And then lastly is 18270. Um, this is um, probably the biggest area or largest area we've edited. Um, so again, um, this goes, it says limited use code, but it's more for daycare regulations. Um, this is where they've been um, historically located, so we're keeping them here. Um, RCW 3670A450 allows cities to apply zoning conditions and other regulations like building, fire, safety, health code, et cetera, as long as these are not more restrictive than conditions imposed on other residential dwellings in the same zone. So we're splitting this into two sections. Section A will be for family daycare homes per the RCWs, and section two applies to daycare centers. So, um, and just this may be also one that would be um, good to show up here um, let me find that in the code. Um, it's attachment C9, second, page 101, the agenda packet. So section one includes regulations that are supported by the RCWs and WACs, which include licensing, parking, passenger loading, noticing, zoning, building, fire, and safety requirements. And then everything that was existing there prior, we've just moved below into a separate section to apply to daycare centers. And that's a section that the Planning Commission could um, tweak and adjust as they want. Um, but the first section, um, we're just outlining, this is what we have to do to be state compliant. And this is what family daycare homes will have to do to be state compliant and also um, comply with city regulations as um, per the RCWs. So that's uh, basically all of our revisions. Um, are there any questions? You know, kind of steamroll it through it again. Um, just, there's, there's a lot to update, um, but a lot of it, again, is state mandates that we are complying to. But um, again, that second section of uh, 18270, um, there are there is some latitude for the planning commission to work with. I, I don't want to I'm not to add any paint to your your list of things to do because you've got a long list. <laughs> but listening to this and going over this uh, family daycare versus daycare centers, you know, it kind of it's kind of mushed together. <clears throat> it would could you sim put something simply on a, on a single sheet, eight and a half by eleven sheet? that says here's this category here's the other category and here's here's the, 
here. It's the things that are that are different are same and, and those two just to kind of give a, a visual a, aid. A visual aid yes. on trying to understand what those two things look like. I know we've been talking about it for an hour here. Yes. And I'm trying to come out with a fog. But if, if if that would be something not to, not not that would I don't want to put a lot of effort into it, but if that's something simple, I, I would like to see something like that. Commissioner Hill, I, oh. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, jumping in, when we propose this to City Council, would we pr would we present it in a red line format? It would have like the existing. I believe so, right, Ethan? We have to um, propose it to City Council in a red line format, but <clears throat> to get to Commissioner Hill's um, question, comment, we could put together like a one page table sort of comparing some of these key things that we're changing. Um, and I, I think that that might sort of zero in on this and calling out areas of, of focus um, that, that the city could choose to focus on versus things that are just, hey, this is state law, this is state law, state law. Um, <clears throat> and and that, might, that might help you drill down a little bit further on. Well, you know, at your last, meet, at your last uh, workshop that you gave the city council, which I thought was excellent, you know, they did a great job on that. Um, I think something like this, also pictorial, something that they can visualize, goes a long way, and you can you can eliminate two pages of a script <laughs> if if you have something that that's put there that we can, we can visually look at, and you you talk to it, but it, oh, okay, and it, it's it's hard it's hard. Yeah, what, what I was thinking of the matrix that says yes. daycare center, abandoned daycare center, donors, yes, no, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what this thing looks like, but something. <laughs> As I was writing this memo, I had the same thoughts, too. <laughs> okay. All right. It, it would aid um, the reviewer and you all better, I would think, as well. So we can definitely do that for the next meeting. Um, I think it's it's doable. I want to take too much time. Thank you. So, yeah. might, also, you just just by way of clarification, kind of the bottom line, after all the discussion, all the background, of, so basically what's on page 101, the 18 270 day daycare use, that's that's the kind of final, this is what we're proposing. And, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding that. That's only one piece of what we're proposing. Well, so there's, I guess there's maybe to try and simplify this as much as we can. Alec talked through two different things tonight. He talked through um, whether family daycares are permitted or not right. in each of the zoning districts. Then he got to 18270 that talks about basically the standards the, that daycare uses, both family daycares and daycare centers have to meet. So, so these, are the, these are the standards for both. Family yes. and daycare. And so the first section deals with daycare homes, and this is pretty much, as, as you said, paralleling the state law, meet licensing requirements, obtain a business license, provide a passenger loading area certified by DCYF, comply with applicable setbacks, coverage, impervious surface, so basically the zoning requirements, um, comply with building fire safety and health code, um, and oh, parking provided to the same, same extent as the residential use, and then prior to state licensing, providers to the providers to provide the city with maybe we could reword that a little bit. Uh, provide the city with proof of having writ, written notification to immediately join your property owner. So that's public notice. So that's that's it. That's that all comes from the state law for family daycares, and then. Everything below that is what's already in the code for daycare centers. Um, and you can see what some of those are. Parking, signage, um, setbacks, again, in, in meeting the zoning district, um, access, sufficient access and maneuvering areas. Um, and then is there more there? I can't remember. Fencing, employees, um, and outdoor 
and an outdoor play area. So that's already in the code, and that that applies, um, did apply, does apply right now to every daycare use, to, no matter its size. Right. But the problem with this section is that it goes for family daycares, it goes above and beyond. In some cases, like for instance, the 100 square feet for outdoor play area, that only 75 feet is required for family daycares. So we put all of that existing stuff in its own section for daycare right. centers. So anyways, that, that's, that's where it's at. Um, so I don't know if there's, there's more questions on that, but those are kind of the two basic things that Alec went over tonight. Permitted or prohibited in each zoning district and then these standards right here. <clears throat> Question on the family daycare in this section. Um, so A says meet all applicable state license requirements. So I would assume that includes the square footage indoor and outdoor, the fencing that's there, um, all those requirements. Um, and those are part of the licensing requirements, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, on G there, it says prior to state license, the provider will provide city proof of notification. Do we want to have some timeline for that? Sorry. G, the last one. But the Carol did No, no, no. The, uh, the other G. Oh, the other G. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there. Oh, right there. So I, I just wonder if we ought to put a timeline on that because. You know, I, I wouldn't want to see these notices going out the day that they're opening the, the daycare, family daycare home. Now, granted, it has to be, according to the, the WAC, it has to be issued. That notice has to be issued before they get their license. So there's already some built-in buffer there. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of the right way to do that because there isn't a whole lot of city process here, right? There's right. no permit being issued and all like that. I'm so, wondering why are we even doing that since it's already part of the required licensing requirement? We can take it out um, uh, since it's part of the licensing requirement. We're just kind of paralleling the, the state law there and because it says that the city can require that they that they do this. Well, my thought was whether we want to expand the state requirement. The state requirement is just immediately adjacent properties, which you know, there might be three homes, two on, one on either side, one behind it. Um, if I was living in the neighborhood, I would want notice of a much broader area than that. But then on the other hand, I get notified that some he's going to put in a lousy daycare center next to me. What recourse do I have? Um, <clears throat> now the state does provide a provision for some kind of reconciliation, but yeah. So so I'm torn there between whether we want to expand the notification, given that there really is no recourse, or whether we ought to be making sure our citizens understand what's going to happen in their community. And I, I sort of sway towards that. The question is, can we? Yeah, that's the thing I'm a little uncertain about is is can we require a broader notice? And I think unfortunately that's another Bronson question. Okay. <laughs> and then I um, can, can you scroll up to the definitions for daycare? You know, this definition is for daycare. Um, and we have we have another type of daycare in our definitions, adult daycare. I'm just wondering if this should be child daycare. Because when I went initially looking at the definitions, I was looking for something of a child, and it wasn't there. Um, thoughts? I mean, I think we've been fairly clear in the way that we've revised the code to specify whether we're talking about family daycares or daycare centers. Um, so I personally, I could be convinced otherwise, but I personally don't see the need to 
say child daycare or child, you know, family child daycare or, or whatever we would say there because we're trying to specifically use terms that are consistent with the state law so that somebody can sort of parallel and go back looking at, at where that comes from and, you know, that it's defined the same way and that sort well, of thing. But, but, but yeah, that, that was going to be my second point is, you know, for we're using the definition uh, daycare center where the RCW uses the term child care center or child daycare center to mean that larger group. And I, would, I was going to suggest we be consistent with those RCW definitions. Um, and likewise, you know, we say family daycare home where the, the, whack, the, the RCW definition is kind of strange because in one case they're talking about centers, the other case they're talking about providers. Anyway, I, I would agree we ought to be consistent with the RCW and the way we use those terms and the daycare center we do not. Okay. And we've also eliminated the 24 hour rule here too in our code. The 24 hour requirements area. Yeah, the uh, oh, oh, the RCW definition yeah, for child there. daycare centers is for less, less than 20. 24 hours. Um, now you can point to RCW says less than 24, but it, I, I, again, I don't know if that needs to be in our code or not. It does show daycare means a person, group, or agency which we which regularly provides care for oh. children for periods of less than 24 yeah, hours. Okay. We did leave that in, and then we have the specific. To different kinds of daycare uses listed below. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Any, any other comments on this? Oh, good. Thank you. Thank Sorry, go ahead. Thank you for your input. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> what about? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I interrupting somebody? No. Nope, oh. Ahead. What about uh, nursery schools? That's another thing that's in the RCW that we don't address. So where does that fall in this spectrum of centers? I don't know. <laughs> do we have? Do we use that? We do not. But in the RCW definitions, in, in which one it is, one of in that list, there's nursery schools, which is early childhood education for preschool children not greater than four hours per day. So if somebody comes to you and says, I want to, I want to put in a nursery school by that definition, what are you going to do with them? <laughs> I think it's a good question. And so um, we'll bone up on that just a little bit for next month. And the RCW and obviously made a distinction between daycare child daycare centers, family daycare providers, and nursery schools. So they're, in their mind, there's a distinction there. Yeah, it looks like it's lumped under preschools and nursery schools. The zone is a bit different. Jess, the, the, uh, the school there that's on Pacific Highway going out of town north on the left-hand side, how is that classified, you know? an ugly yellow building. <laughs> they just they were taken over here about a year ago and so on. Tried to paint their building. <laughs> there ought to be a law against that. <laughs> they called it urban learning. What's that? It was called urban learning. Urban. But, but, they, but they're a license, that's a licensed business there. Yeah, so they have um, a business license. They didn't have to go through land use because they took over an existing use. Right. Um, or previously existing use. Um, and I know that I looked at what I forget. Are they what called? Was are called they dealt, for. Are they called a daycare or are they called a child a school or something? Early learning is what. Early they, learning. Yeah, okay. Sounds like a nursery school. Could be nursery, yeah. Could be like yeah so it could, could be family daycare home. 
this family daycare home, if you look at the definition, it shows early learning facility. Right. That's that part do, of the definition. Do people live in that house? In this? No, in that, the yellow in one down yellow here. One. No. So, so, yeah, so that's the distinction. A family yeah. so that would be a care home is, right. a, is a residence is. that the provider yeah. lives in. No, yeah, you have a good point. Um, and we do have a definition in our city code for nursery schools. So we need to either revise that um, to the RCW and make that distinction just to clarify um, nursery schools are different use than a family daycare home because, like Commissioner Nuffrock pointed out, um, Family daycare homes are for providers that live in the home as well, where a nursery school, you're not going to have that. Right. It's more of a commercial use. And, and we need to include that in our in our use tables. Yeah. We agree. The one that used to be on the corner of Aspen and 10th, uh, the owners or the that ran that did in fact live upstairs. So they lived on the property here that was a daycare center. But, but the Teresa's little school that's just right here, that's more of a considered a preschool. Uh, a it's a preschool, but also a tutoring center as well. And so they they went through everything through the state again to get qualifications to be there. Okay, one one other thing I found in looking through this is sort of off the subject, but 18150, which is our commercial districts, that title says C1, C3, and MX. We we're supposed to be taking the MX off in there. And we took it off the use table, but it's still there under the purpose. There's also an MX district paragraph that we ought to get rid of both of those. Yep. All right. Are we ready for 1.72? I am. Good, good work, Alan. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Like, that's a lot of work. Yeah. That's a lot of work. I may have had a few comments, but I think you did a good No, job. that's that's okay. It's it's been um, a lot of going back and forth with Ethan and uh, Bronson and because there's just a lot of great areas in this, so it's good to have this discussion. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Well done. Uh, let's move on to one dot seven two, the manufacturing homes memo. And uh I'll hand it back over to you guys because I'm not gonna work right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so just a really quick reminder about what this topic is, is all about. Um, we introduced this to you last month. Um, again, this is would be bringing the city's code into compliance with state requirements. And what those state requirements say is that the city can't regulate the siting of manufactured homes that meet um, <clears throat> federal construction and safety standards differently than homes built to any other standard. Um, except for in a few specific ways. It can require that they be new and or designated manufactured homes, and we'll talk about what we mean by designated here in a few minutes. Um, it can require that they be set up on a foundation and enclosed at the bottom, um, and that they comply with local design standards that would normally apply to any other residents in that zone, and that they meet state energy code. So those are the only things <clears throat> that the state can regulate for for siting of manufactured homes. Just um, and um, another important note on this is to um, remember that we're talking about placement of an individual manufactured home on one lot here. We're not talking about um, the, the state requirements aren't talking about larger communities and subdivisions. However, we will talk about a little bit about manufactured home communities and subdivisions tonight because as with any code update, this code update does have some tentacles. You know, we talked about family daycares with ALEC and that started affecting multiple pieces of the code. That's the same with this. And one of the topics that this closely related topics that this affects are the city's existing regulations for manufactured home subdivisions, um, which are contained in the MDR code. So we did some moving around <clears throat> of the code um, to make it all hopefully make sense. Um, but I just wanted to sort of give you those sort of introductory reminders about what this is about. Um, <clears throat> So a point of clarification for me. 
I remember from years past, I was under the impression that we could not restrict the siting of a single manufactured home on a legal lot, but we could restrict communities or subdivisions. Is that is that the case? That's true. Yeah. So we can outright prohibit communities and subdivisions. I think that that's true. I think that that's true. <clears throat> and then you always have that the uh, HOA right. to standards on top of that. Yeah. I think they trump everything. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, we are proposing, well, actually, let me back up one step, which is that there was a question last month about what the differences are between manufactured homes and mobile homes. And those are two different things. We provided that answer for you um, in the memo. If you want, I can sort of read that for you or you can look at it on your own. But we have definitions now for, for manufactured homes and, and mobile homes and we've revised those to be compliant with um, state requirements. <clears throat> um, so, in the definition section of the code, which again is 18.40, we're proposing to revise and add some new definitions in there. Um, and <clears throat> the new definitions that we are adding um, include definitions for manufactured um, mobile home communities, that's one, and then manufactured mobile home subdivisions, that's two. Three is revising the definition, sorry, adding the definition for park models, which is a type of, of RV. We're also revising the definition of recre recreational vehicles. Um, <clears throat> um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well, because the city can't prohibit the placement of recreational vehicles in existing manufactured home communities. <clears throat> okay, so the first sort of essential issue and, and policy question that we want you to ponder a little bit is um, whether or not this, and, and this was touched on last month again as well, and, and I think Commissioner Rock made a comment about it, but um, whether or not the city should require that manufactured homes be new or designated or both. Um, and in reviewing the code, um, and I apologize that the memo doesn't reflect this and we just sort of came to this realization today, but um, the code requires both currently, that they be new and that they be designated. It has a very roundabout way of saying that. Um, so... Isn't that a conflict? No, I don't well, think I thought so. designated was anything built after 1976. It's not a conflict because designated new is built after 1976. <laughs> um, and designated has specific requirements for um, uh, uh, meeting federal requirements comprised of two fully enclosed section, parallel sections of minimum size 12 by 36 feet, having certain type of roof, um, uh, as long uh, as well as a, pit, a roof pitch of three to twelve, and then siting similar to site built homes. So, so basically, you know, if you say new, that might mean that it's not designated, meaning that it could be smaller or different than that. It could have different siting. It could have different um, type of roof. Um, <clears throat> if you say new and designated, it has to meet all of those things. And obviously, new would be after 1976. So. <laughs> Um, so but that's that's what the existing code. Yeah, but doesn't the new also include the provision that it's never been titled before? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's what the existing code does, which, as I said, we sort of read through that initially. We thought there was a conflict, and that the definitions did one thing, and then that the, and then the citing standards did another thing. <clears throat> but as I said, it, it looks like both are required currently. So if you decided to do, if you recommended that the city council choose both new and designated, that wouldn't be a change from existing policy. Now the, the 
you know, policy questions are always kind of tied up in, well, what should we do? And um, so in this case, I mean, there's reasons to do one or, or the other or both, um, but that all kind of centers around the idea of, or, or a couple of the key concepts are, you know, number one, housing affordability. And so if you require that they be new, you're probably also um, affecting the affordability of somebody to place a home like that in the center, <clears throat> good or bad. Um, if you only require they be designated, um, then they're presumably, in some instances, more affordable. Um, <clears throat> uh, although those two things have some crossover, right? Because some type of new manufactured home might be actually smaller and perhaps less expensive, like a park model RV, than, um, than a designated home. So, well, but park um, RV you couldn't put in LDR or MDR zone, right? Well, <clears throat> what the... Because it's not a manufactured home. What the code, it's a recreation, it's a type of recreational vehicle. Um, and what the, what the state law on that says is that the city can't prohibit placement of recreational vehicles in manufactured home communities. So if a manufactured home community was established in the center, I, th I think there's one that I'm aware of, um, <clears throat> that, and this is a change that has happened in the state law in the last, couple of years that the city, if somebody comes to the city and says, I have this park model RV, some people call those tiny homes as well. You might be familiar with that term or heard, heard that mentioned before. The city can't prohibit somebody from placing a park model R RV or a tiny home in an existing, um, in an existing manufactured home community. <clears throat> um, okay, so that's the definition section. Um, and well, I then, guess, I guess on the policy question, since you raised that, I, I'm in favor of saying only new as opposed to designated. I mean, that's the question we got to decide. Well, that's one. That's it's, one aspect of the new, question: new or designated, or new, new and or designated, or both. You could require both. We can require just new, though. You could require just new, but then, but now didn't you say new only means it's built after 1976? No. That's designated. Oh, that's designated. New means it, it is new. It, it is hasn't new. been titled okay. before to anyone. Okay. You know, my point is, I wouldn't want somebody moving a 1980s double wide in next to me. And that's what a designated is. Yeah. A manufactured home that is that a 50 wide. years old. That doesn't make sense to me in our community. That's why I would prefer that we just that's only not allow more manufactured homes. Yeah, do we have that lot? Of, that's not a state requirement of designated. Is it? Um, it's a state definition, and the city can choose to require that they be designated oh, okay. or or new or both. <laughs> so that that's the point I want to keep making to you. It, the city can require both. So when commission, no, can require both. So when, so when Commissioner Notbrock, when you're saying you're in favor of new, I just want the commission to understand that that might mean that somebody could place a new manufactured home that doesn't meet the designated requirements. In other words, smaller, doesn't include siting that's similar to single family residences, doesn't include a certain roof pitch. So if you require new and designated, you, that's that's sort of the highest. Can can we not say new friends must meet the requirements as set forth as designated? That's so, basically what I'm saying. You can require new and designated. Well, but we don't want designated to open, trump new. Well, it, it won't trump new. No, you would just have to meet both. Yeah. Well, my both. point is, I don't want an old, 50-year-old manufactured <laughs> home hauled into the lot next to me. That's designated. Right, but if you require new and designated, I would get that. You wouldn't get an old manufactured home, right? 
Because right. it would still have it's, to be It has new to be new because designated meets more than built after 1996. Oh, so, okay. So it's not, <laughs> it's yeah, not it new or designated. Correct. Right. New and designated. Yeah. That's one of the things. Cap or any of the above. So there's four choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's three that I'm seeing. Oh, oh, yeah. There's there's the city can require, des require designated, period. Yeah. The city can require new, period. The city can require new and designated. That's three. Or new or designated. Well, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's the first two. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think new and add is, is probably the best answer because the, the designation portion indicates that it's going to have the proper siding and all the other amenities that, that we, we want to have on the property, but it's going to be brand spanking new. Yes. Yeah. I think I think and that that's would work. Huh? Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, yeah, but that yeah. makes it less affordable because so that, that's okay. Because the, 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 that's yeah, okay. but it is okay. I just want to make yeah. sure we were. That removes. But, the, but and the one thing that it eliminates, so it, it would eliminate a new, but just single, wide type of manufactured home, so it, it would not allow a new tiny home. Um, probably. <clears throat> Correct, because that wouldn't meet the that wouldn't meet the definition of a manufactured home, but it would be a recreational vehicle, exactly. which the city cannot. That that's a separate but related okay. issue. But the city cannot prevent a recreational vehicle from locating in manufactured home community. Community. Yes. But it has to be in a community. A, 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 a rec manufactured yeah, recreational community. vehicle, which includes a park model RV, which is a tiny home. Does that make sense? I think we're on yeah. the same page. <laughs> okay. So think about that <laughs> a little bit, and give me your and give me your thoughts. It sounds it sounds like what I'm hearing is that I've heard I think two at least two commissioners say should be new and designated. The yeah, which is what the existing code already does. And they were convinced, and that, that would. Not allow the 50 year old designated. Right. Model. Well, if it's new and designated, how could you have a, if you say it's new, how could you have a 50 year old? I mean, that's, I mean, unless it had never been titled before, I guess, right? It needs to be and in capital letters. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And, and I want to understand, Otherwise, uh, I want to understand the thing about, about 50 year old. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> nothing at all. <laughs> okay, good. Depends on what kind of siding you have. <laughs> My siding is good on that. I'll have to look at it. Okay, yeah, I, I think you got it. We're good. Okay. So, so and, sorry. And that is the current code, actually. Yes. It does say new and designated yes. anyway. So, so the so, state requirement okay. isn't having us change that. The, the, New state code is not having us, it's not prohibiting us from doing that. Itself. No, correct. Um, being designated though, am I tying in something with the tiny homes that that was only for a mobile uh, 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 manufactured. manufactured home community? Uh, a tiny home wouldn't replace a manufactured home on any site, though. No. That's only partly true. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's oh. the only little nuance I, I detected. Only partly. So, again, um, a tiny home is not a manufactured home. It doesn't meet yeah, so it doesn't meet the definition of a manufactured home. That's okay? an RV. It's an RV. Got it. Okay. So you the city, look. yeah, the city cannot prevent the placement of an RV, including a park model in an existing manufactured home community. So that means that if you're in you're in a single family subdivision, Southview Heights, Gordon's Crest, whatever, somebody can't come in there and put a tiny home on a lot next to you because that's not a manufactured home community. But they could put it in Country Hills Estates. Does that make sense? No, I, I, thank you. Because I, I, that that was very is, oh, oh, that is the manufactured home yes. community. Yes. Okay. What about, or maybe it doesn't because it's not in the city, just a, if there's a, somebody owns a parcel of land, not in a subdivision, 
All right. But so would it be in that community? This the city in in are you you're asking about the tiny home again? Yeah. yeah. Just curious. The city in that case, the city could either choose to prevent or not prevent that. But what the city cannot choose to do is prevent their placement in the manufactured home community. Right. They cannot prevent that. But yes. They could prevent it <laughs> just on a lot, not in a subdivision. Right. Thank you for that. Um, okay. So as with family daycares, and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here on the zoning of you know uh, each of the <clears throat> zones. But basically, what we've tried to do is permit manufactured homes, um, per permit the placement of manufactured homes where single family site built homes are already allowed. So that includes LDR, MDR, um, MX, MX <clears throat> and that's it. I think that's it, right? Did we say something about RP? Alex is going to check on that briefly. And then prohibit the placement of manufactured homes in commercial districts, C1, C3, and in the JP Junction Plan District because we said single new single family homes aren't allowed there, so we don't have to allow manufactured homes either. So that's kind of what we did with the that's kind of what we did with the zoning. Um, then 1880.070 is the city's code that currently talks about. It, it, I think it's called manufactured home installation standards. Um, and so generally, what that requires are things like anchoring, um, skirting around the bottom stairs and a landing um, and so we went through that code section and changed it to comply with what we you know what what we're understanding the state requirements to be um, uh, and in particular one thing that we did was move the things that we think are inconsistent with state requirements to their own section. And so if a manufactured home does not meet federal requirements um, and uh, the, meaning that the city can't, meaning that the city can't regulate it in a way that is outside of the state, what the state says, we move that stuff to, to a new section. So in other words, the stuff that deals with uh, steps and that requires steps and a landing, a perimeter or masonry wall um, have been moved to their own section along with the transportation requirements because those go above and beyond the state requirements. Okay, so those will apply to manufactured home subdivisions and communities now but not to placement of an individual manufactured home. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we did with that. Um, <clears throat> then um, we created a new section 1818080 um, that addresses some of these things about restricting the placement that, that that the city's not allowed to restrict placement of um, of RVs, for instance, um, uh, and as well as not being able to restrict placement of a manufactured home based on age, dimensions, or setbacks. Um, so that's now included in there as well. <clears throat> I don't understand the what setback. What age are we? 199. Why why can't we regulate setbacks? Well, so not setbacks alone. So if if there's an existing lot in a manufactured home community that um, 
has smaller dimensions, the city can't say, you can't place a manufactured home here because it's not meeting setbacks specifically. However, <laughs> the city can say that that manufactured home has to meet fire safety requirements. So in the building code, for instance, there's a requirement that structures have to be at least six feet apart, um, which is different than the single family setback, for instance, that says, or the MDR setback that might say, hey, you have to have seven and a half feet to the property line. That's a setback versus the distance between houses and the building code. That's a safety requirement that's meant to prevent fires. <clears throat> um, so the other thing I, I wanted to mention really quickly is that we took these man, these standards that apply to manufactured home subdivisions that are currently contained in the medium density residential code, and we dropped it in this 18180. And the reason that we did that is because it seemed like those standards would be useful for other zones outside of MDR, could be useful for LDR too, because you can establish a manufactured home subdivision in the LDR zone as a conditional use. Um, so we took those standards in there, they'll be more general and then they'll be referenced into both the L LDR and the MDR code. Um, so the, the standards that we're talking about are the ones that are up on the screen in front of you right now that came from the MDR and now they're in 18180. It talks about roof lines and the pitch. Um, it requires rain protection. Um, it talks about the finished surfaces, um, architectural grade, natural building products such as wood, masonry, metal glass, blah, 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 blah. Newer replacement structures shall employ a diverse use of color. Is there, there's one more, that's it, I think. Um, so now, if somebody wants to establish a manufactured home subdivision or community, they have to comply with these requirements. Those go above and beyond the state law for placement of an individual manufactured home. Scroll up, if you would, to um, the Question. top of this, and then we'll... Do we have any of those going on, as you know, within our state uh, today? Subdivisions or... Manufactured home subdivisions. I don't, I, I'm not they must be somewhere. Huh? Not that I could name. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm not seeing any, and I've never heard of any. I know one in Gig Harbor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it came from those. Okay, but that's been the last couple. Oh, five oh years. no, no, it's been there for a while. Oh, yeah, well, we have one here in town, but right. I'm talking about new. I'm talking about some brand spanking new. Oh, yeah. Not that I could name. Okay. But, but again, I, and I probably should have said this earlier, but the difference between a subdivision and a community, ownership versus rental. That's kind of the essential difference there. So manufactured home subdivision is where everybody would own their own piece of land, just like a single family subdivision. Okay. Um, manufactured home communities is where they would rent, rent lease a property. lot <laughs> within, the, within the community. But they're still a manufactured home. Yes. Or they could be other things. They could be RVs. Huh? They could be RVs. Also. The RV. Okay. So right right now, uh, subdivisions and communities are conditional use in LDR and MDR. Um, so what what does conditional use mean here? What do they have to prove to get approved? They have to go to a public hearing in front of the hearing examiner. So that's one thing. Um, and then so there's public I, comment there. What's that? Public comment. Public comment. Um, and then they also have to meet the conditional use permit criteria. And I what's I don't know if we can pull those up quickly. Um, Say what you just said. The conditional use permit criteria. Let's see if we can find that oh, quickly. God. I guess my, where my question is going is why would ever want content? to approve a mobile Sorry. home subdivision or community in an LDR district? I'm not sure how, why we'd want to. Well, I guess, I don't know, and maybe this is, has to do with how the code was originally structured that the thought was to put them only in MDR. Um, 
I guess I can think of just as many questions about compatibility and that sort of thing for MDRs. Well, as, I, yeah, I, I LDR. agree. The, uh, mm -hmm. When you think about the uproar you had over those apartments up here in Aspen. Okay, that's good. Can you imagine the uproar if they, somebody wanted to come in there and put a mobile home community? Um, I just don't think it's compatible with our either one of our zoning districts. So that there's some criterion. Oh yeah, zero criteria for approval. For it. So right. these are the criteria that apply to conditional uses. So this would apply to a manufactured home, subdivision, or community, and LDR and MDR. Um, and these these are the criteria, by the way, that apply to any conditional use in the city. Characteristics of the site are suitable to accommodate the proposed use. All required public facilities are present, basically. The proposed use complies with the applicable requirements of the zone, except as otherwise approved by variance. Establishment, maintenance, and operation of the proposed use will not, in the circumstances of a particular case, be significantly detrimental to the health, safety, or general welfare of persons residing. I mean, these are, these. I guess these are mostly typical conditional use permit criteria. A lot of times you see um, a compatibility requirement for conditional uses as well, which I'm not really seeing that so much here. But those are the criteria that they would have to go through. I guess I, I would propose we prohibit them everywhere. Prohibit manufactured home subdivision. That's the question. Okay. That's all on the yeah. table. In, that... in LDR or MDR or both? both? What are we saying? So you would say there could be a manufactured home community where it's the, the rented lots? Neither. Neither one. So, you, so well, we have the one is, existent one, but not anymore. Right. I mean, like, in, I, I don't know how they could put one in an LDR zone or, or an MDR zone because of density requirements. Right. And, you know, the typical manufactured community or subdivision wouldn't be meeting those kind of density requirements. So other than the fact that I don't think they are compatible with our community. When you say not meeting density requirements, you mean they'd be too dense or not dense enough? They're too dense. Well, in I MDR so. they wouldn't be, right? What? In MDR they wouldn't be, so I wouldn't think. Because I mean, if you can do apartments up to 16 units per acre, <laughs> I would think you could get. You can't do can't do 16, it's 14. 16 with the density transfer. Right. Aside but, from what they did out there at Riverside, which was much in excess of that. Yeah. So I... So, so they did exceed it? Yeah. So I... You certainly, could, you certainly would exceed it in an LDR. Is it a state requirement? No. Well, you wouldn't exceed it in an LDR either because... <laughs> Sorry, they would have to meet the single family lot requirements, 7,500 square feet, 20 foot front, rear setback, seven and a half. So yeah. you'd have these manufactured homes on, on fairly large lots. So you'd, but lose, you'd lose all the motivation for doing it in the first place. Because yeah, the like idea is high density, low cost kind of development. Yeah, like you kind of destroy the business aspect. Is that but but I, would, I would just assume outright prohibit it and avoid that discussion. Is that a Bronson thing, or? I would want to check with them and see if there's not something that we're violating there, but yeah. And that's what I started the discussion with, is whether we could prohibit those communities and subdivisions. I so can ask him if that's the, um, you know, if that's the, the consensus. Now you can certainly make an argument that we ought to be making provisions for affordable housing and those right. kind of things, but. I have a hard time with that. Particularly, I go up there and look at what we have now, what that looks like. That's certainly not compatible with what we currently have in MDR and LDR. What's that? The, the current, the, the one manufactured home community that is there. No. I didn't quite catch that. What about the one? Well, it's just. I'm just saying that what we have out there now, I don't view as compatible with either one of our zoning districts. 
and, and I can imagine our citizens would be in uproar if somebody wanted to build one of those next to them. So that's my input on a policy question, <laughs> debate, <laughs> or move on. So the last thing I wanted to mention, and then we should probably move on, well, I'll let the chair decide that. But, um, if you go, sorry, up above this. In the code, though? Jeff, yeah. So I just wanted to point out to them what the requirements are for placement of an individual manufactured home. So keep, yeah, going up, going up. Um, Insulation standards? Yeah, so here's what, if somebody wants to place an individual manufactured home, this is what they would have to do. It has to be new, as defined by that RCW. Um, that basically says it has to meet or exceed the federal construction and safety standards, which we took out because that is contained within the definition of a manufactured home now, right? Isn't that where we took that out? Oh, yes, listed above. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, and then this talks about the designated portion of it, which we're thinking about taking this out right here and just putting it in the definition. But it, this talks about the two parallel sections and the size um, and uh, the roofing. Um, so, anyways, that that's what the that's designated right there, basically, is what that's so saying. So that's the definition of designated. Yeah. Which you've already established in another definition previously. We're going to we're think I'm we're I'm thinking about updating the definition or including a definition of designated manufactured home and then we could just reference that okay so go down um, a little bit um, this talks about the found oops, sorry. sorry the foundation being set up on the foundation and the space at the bottom of the home to the ground is, is enclosed by concrete or approved concrete product again that's straight out of state law um, keep going down one please Um, now that standard was moved down below, right, to the additional, oh no, we eliminated, sorry, we eliminated that one because we felt like it duplicated too much what was the requirement of state law. Um, <clears throat> well, but that's still required, right? I mean, it's it immediate, required. immediately above it. Yeah, it already is stated. Um, and then manufactured homes shall comply with all other site and density design and dimensional standards zoning district in which they are located. Um, has to meet the energy code. Um, and then that's it. So that's what you would do if you're replacing an individual manufactured code, uh, home. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> talking about code too much. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap it well, there. So, so they, they have to meet all the requirements of the zone that they're going to. Yes. Setbacks, parking. All of it. All of it. All of it. Um, so next month we will come back to you with some slightly adjusted code, some answers to some of the questions that you're asking. Um, I guess the question we have for you, okay, either way. <laughs> is whether you'll be comfortable at that point going to a public hearing. If you want to see the draft code one more time, then public hearing in month four. <clears throat> You're talking about a red line code next time? Uh, well, no? this is the red line code even right now, but well, we would adjust it based uh, upon some of the conversation tonight and then open up a public hearing next month. And with the intent that you forward a recommendation of some kind. And that recommendation can be changes to what you propose. Yes. Right. I mean, I, I have no problem going to a public hearing. No. Nope. Yeah. There could be quite a bit to chew on there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so feel free to speak up if you guys would be comfortable seeing I'm fine. red lines and going to. So, public hearing would be next for sure. Yeah. I'll be okay with that. Okay.
question. The, the RCW and our definitions uh, have a modular home definition, but it's not in any of our use tables. I feel like that's a manufactured home, isn't it? No. The, the RCW definition is a factory assembled that doesn't have its own running gear and it is not a mobile home or manufactured home. I've actually seen those. I think I've seen those in the film. And so there's, like I said, the RCW has a very specific definition that excludes manufactured home. Manufactured and modular homes are two different things. Um, and so I'm curious on whether we should be addressing that. Again, what are you going to do when somebody comes with a modular home? What are you going to tell them to do? So yeah, you got to think about that. Okay. I think that's mainly like <clears throat> prefab. Well, no, prefab includes manufactured modular and mobile homes. Prefab is a broad category. Subdivisions are mobile homes, manufactured homes, modular homes. Hmm. It'll be interesting to see what you find with that. Okay. All right. Anything else on 1.72? Going once? <laughs> Going twice? Okay. Good job. Yeah, that was very nice. Thank you. Um, thanks for helping us understand yeah. that better. Yeah. Um, any new business from any of the commissioners that you'd like to bring forward at this time? Okay. Hearing no new business, let's roll on to 1.9, which is the uh, community development staff report. No. Yeah. Do you have, you have any energy left? What's that? <laughs> Do you have any energy left? <laughs> um, okay, the first thing I'll talk about is the very first row, which is the Lockwood Meadows subdivision. So they filed engineering plans with the city um, as well as a critical areas permit and a tree cutting permit. Um, because they hadn't done that at the preliminary subdivision stage, we conditioned them to do that. There's an oak tree on Lockwood Creek Road um, that unfortunately, because of the improvements that they have to make on Lockwood Creek Road, they have to, re well, they have to encroach into that oak tree's um, protective buffer, which means they have to get a critical areas permit to do that. So. We're looking at those things now. Um, so they have not submitted those yet, but they have, that's what is needed to be done. Is that correct? They have submitted it and we're reviewing it. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's see, Stevens Hillside Farm, um, they have filed a number of different things They've filed a final plat application. Um, that's number one. Number two is a variance application. And number three is a um, development agreement. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> having trouble getting this out. What, what kind of variance? So they want variances for the front setbacks of 60. 61 homes in there to be placed closer to the street. Only the living space, though. The garage would still be back 20 feet. Um, and so we told them, well, okay, if you're going to do that, we want you to enter into a development agreement to give us certain things, more open space, more trail connections. And they also submitted a variety of elevations for those homes so we can kind of see what they're going to place in that subdivision because what we, we didn't want the same house repeated over and over, especially if it was going to be closer to the street. How close are you? Up to 10 feet, Wow. which is a trend. And these are, um, most of these are uh, single level homes that they're proposing to do this with um I love how the elevations are on the website it reminds me. Okay. So, so yes. they, they meet the rear setback and not the front setback. 
that would. Right. Yep. They're wanting more backyard is what they're wanting. Uh, yeah, I've, seen, I've walked off, seen, I've seen the property up there, I've seen it. The backyard is almost non-existent along uh, those homes there. Yeah, a lot of those, a lot of those um, lots, because it was built on such a big slope, a lot of those lots have barely any rear rear backyards. Right. Um, the other thing that they're doing is providing a lot of single level homes, which are coming into popularity again. You know, for a long time it was like very hard to find a, a single level home, and now those are kind of um, uh, at the top of the market <laughs> for <the> elderly. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of what they're doing there. They have all of this stuff is now on the website, uh, their application, the development agreements there, the variance applications there, and the elevations that go along with the development agreement and the variance are there. Um, the other th thing I'll say on the final plat, there's a couple of issues there. One is critical areas mitigations because they were approved back in 2018 to provide a park in the stream buffer, that unnamed stream that's a tributary to Bolin Creek. Um, and they never accounted for those impacts. So we're working with them to update their critical areas reports to quantify those impacts prior to them getting final plat approval, which will set up the lots which will establish the lots. Um, and then the, the other thing that they're doing or will need to do that we're working with them on is there's a large out parcel in that development. It's right behind the 13 up there on the screen. And they need to provide access to that so that it can develop in the future. And that was a condition of approval of the preliminary plat as well so we have a meeting with them on friday to talk about these things but those are what are, what's the status of the easement discussion for the connection to bolin is that still oh part of um i mean that's a requirement of the plot you're talking about the road that'll cross over and connect to bolin that's a requirement of the plot so they're required to um dedicate Right of way. Once the city figures out exactly where the connection is going to go, they're required to dedicate the right of way to make that connection. But they weren't required to build the road right. as part of the. Question: uh, Do you recall uh, in Riverside Estates, were they given an exemption or uh, uh, regards to setbacks? No. Or yard setbacks? No. No. Okay. Well, I visualize. As I try to visualize those homes, it seemed like they're right there. Well, M MDR has a uh, MDR has a, a less setback. Okay. Um, okay, That's let's see. We just issued the high school um, a sign permit today to place a monument sign at the entrance to their uh, along the road there at the entrance to their driveway and parking area that is a combination um, backlit sign and electronic reader board. Um, <clears throat> so um, that was issued today. And then the elementary school has also applied for a sign permit and that would be an electronic message, sent, freestanding electronic message center backlit sign combination um, as well. That replaces the existing sign? They're going to place it on the existing poles out there. Does that mean code? Yeah. Oh. If you look at the sign modification section, it talks about if they don't modify the existing structural supports more than 10%, then they don't have to bring those up to standard. 10% of value or? Uh, right. 10% of the existing code requirement, I think is what it says. <clears throat> so so much for all our hard work with signs, trying to get nice looking signs in town. <laughs> um, ACES view, 
subdivision. That one is undergoing engineering review right now. Um, Valley View was per, went, underwent preliminary plat review um, a while ago, um, and they are working on, I believe, submitting engineering plans, but we're also working on with, with, with them on preserving one of the trees in that subdivision that they're trying to make the case that they can't preserve. Um, uh, advanced builders, those are the couple of lots behind the Palace Casino. And one of, well, both of those are proposed to be a fourplex. One of them, which is closest to the casino, had a pre-application meeting on it a while ago. Um, and then the one that's furthest from the casino uh, submitted a site plan review application a couple months ago, and it's been deemed incomplete a couple times now. Um, let's see, what else? Podunk Pizza, it looks like they've moved into their new space. And so yeah, I they're... think Dennis and I could recommend them. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could do. Yeah, I yeah, good job. I think we told you about the hotel last month. There was a pre-app for a hotel on the Van Bessen property at the junction there where there's currently um, rock grinding equipment and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, the the property that's up Aspen on the on the on the east side heading up the hill, but I don't see that on here. That was the property that just sold here recently. Oh oh, thirteen nineteen Aspen. Yeah, It'll be they're... on the west side. No, it's no. on the east side. I'm running this by mine. Sorry. <laughs> what, what? Yeah, I don't see that on here, but um, so they had a pre-application meeting. I don't know. It was probably almost two months ago now. They haven't um, submitted final anything yet, though. The, the lace, the layouts on the on the website. For the pre-app. Pre-app. Yeah. yeah, for the pre-application. Yeah. yeah. It ought to be on here. I, and looking at that, though, I, I the more I look at that, I sure struggle. You know, they're gonna they got these two. I get. I'm gonna call them cul-de-sacs that just go off of Aspen to the east. And then the houses, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, you, you barely have a room in there for a fire truck to turn around. I mean, <clears throat> it's, I mean, it's it's kind of like, I don't know. It just seems, it just doesn't seem like it's. It's tight. There's no doubt about it. And that. It's really tight. Go ahead. Yeah, that's that site is very challenging. <laughs> And, and the fire department Based. has no problem with that, huh? Well, they'll have to meet fire code requirements, right? So those turnarounds have to be able to accommodate a fire truck on them. Um, and the city's not going to approve something that doesn't meet the fire code right, well, that's, I'm sure, requirements. Yeah. But, but yeah, just, you're right. It just, it's extremely it, tight in there. It is really. They've not left them. They've, they're using every ounce of space yeah. and getting away with just minimum requirements as far as uh, access, a a egress, a access, egress, whatever. Um, anyways, okay. But uh, that should be on here, though. Um, yeah. I Was that just a, I think just we probably should add it. I don't know if it. I removed it because it, I mean, we issued their, no, their pre-application notes. So, okay. Yeah. That's once, once they submit, if they actually come back and submit for um, preliminary subdivision, it'll come back on here. Oh. You'll see, because they'll they'll make revisions based on the comments okay. we made. So we'll get back on here. Yeah, as long as they submit for it, which. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question. So yeah. Uh, on so there's a hotel that number fifty nine, and then also on number four at the minute management. Right, there's two different management. hotels coming in. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Both, both, yeah, there's 111. They say it's 100. They're going to the website, it's 111 room hotel also. And one across, minute, the, minute, one minute across minute. the freeway, too. Yeah, as well as the A one. Yeah. Right. So three hotels right there. Room tax. That big sign coming in there that's uh, that's right there at their property. One of my neighbors said, Dennis, 
I see they're going to be building uh, uh, condominiums there at the uh, at the junction, and they're leasing them. I said, that's not that's not what's going in here. I think oh, the east. Uh, they put an apartment sign for the sign. For yeah. the East Fork yeah. Commons. Probably for Rich, for uh, Riverside, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it's right there and that property. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got people thinking that there's going to be condominiums going to go in there or something. Right there. So those are two hotels yeah. on, on this side. Yeah. On the Les and, a, and a gas and a, uh, and the gas station. a hotel and a coffee drive through, I think. Yeah, on 59. Yeah. As well as all the stuff that's going on on four. Right. That's all I had on the report. Any questions? Good job, guys. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Ethan. Appreciate the uh, coverage there. Uh, moving on to um, Planning Commissioner and alternate uh, comment. Uh, Commissioner Brock, please do. No, thank you. I have nothing to add. I have nothing to add either. Thank you. Sure. All no, right. No, no, no comments. Um, and uh, going on to 110, I've been texting you guys. Thanks for getting back to me like you guys always do. And um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. What, what, what's on the agenda next time? Do we want to talk that or do oh. we need to talk that? Two topics you'll love, family daycares and manufactured homes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he's, he'll bring back the work plan. The work I plan. took that note as well. Just a status on it. Yeah, yeah, a status. Of yes. Work. And we may see a pictorial. <laughs> yeah, he wants a picture. Okay, I'm done. So I have a, a motion on the floor to adjourn, but I do not have a second. A second. Okay, we got a second. <laughs> Um, I'll just do all those in favor. Say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thanks, so, guys. So if somebody Thank is staying, do they have to stay here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, because we have the majority. So it would be good. Yeah. The majority would win. Just thanks for keeping us posted. <laughs>